Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, key lawmakers in education talk about improving literacy, tackling mental health, and funding for E-12 education. Plus, the full Senate debates measures to combat climate change and prohibit rent control. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Senator Roger Chamberlain, chair of the Senate Education Committee, is promoting measures to improve how kids learn to read, protect kids from social media algorithms, and he's looking into alleged fraud in a nutrition assistance program. He joins me now. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good to see you. So you've said that the focus of the Senate's supplemental education bill is literacy, and to that end, it would direct $30 million to improve reading proficiency among elementary students. Mm -hmm. How will this be accomplished? Well, it's about $31 million. We have five pieces to the legislation. It's nine pages, incredibly focused and targeted. One is to uh, uh, get professional de de development uh, stuff to the, to the teachers at no cost to them. We didn't want to do any mandates, just put the money out there. Teachers were shortchanged, a lot of teachers were shortchanged in their teacher prep. They weren't, they weren't being taught, they weren't taught how to teach kids to read. So thousands of teachers were left out in the cold, short change, and meant hundreds of thousands of kids were not uh, learning how to read. Teachers has expressed that to me, superintendents, parents. So this, uh, that's the biggest part of the bill. Then we uh, put some other uh, resources in there to remove some mandates, um, and uh, also money for regional centers so that they can help support rural rural uh, districts with that effort as well. So uh, we already have some things in law, uh, so we don't have to do that, but we need to get our teachers up to speed and they've been very supportive, bipartisan support. So getting the teachers up to speed, uh, this state would use this program that's called L-E-T-R-S, Letters, mm -hmm. Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. And I Googled it quickly and many, many states are implementing this to improve reading. Uh, your bill provides funding for this specific training, is that right? Yes, it's, it's to allow teachers, uh, give grants to teachers to take it at no cost to themselves and no cost to the districts. It's targeted, focused, because uh, look, 60% uh, of the, about 60% of the kids in Minneapolis St. Paul cannot read at grade level. Many of them are just, can't read at all. Um, statewide, that's 40% that can't read. The trend has been down for the last uh, nine years. It's been going down, it's been getting worse. So uh, the focus on literacy is nothing else matters, right? We can't do math or science without it. And if you're um, having problems reading, you don't wanna to go to school, there's behavior problems, there's mental health problems. 74, 75% of the uh, people in prison are, are uh, only reading at fourth grade. So it's a big deal, it's, it's, nothing else matters. And we've been getting worse for over the years. So time to change and give the teachers help. As I understand it, many of the teacher training programs in colleges and universities <clears throat> do not really teach teachers how to read. Is there a way that this legislation can encourage those th the teachers to be to ensure that they get training? I read teachers saying, you know, how much more they understand about how kids learn to read and yeah. therefore can help them learn to read better. Well, it's one of the great tragedies here, and I don't know how it happened, but. Ten years ago, in, put in statute, more than ten years ago, put in statute that if you're teaching, if you're going to teach elementary ed, you had to get science of reading. And that's what this letters is. It's science of reading. Well, we had a teacher licensing board and the current Pelsby board in charge of licensing was supposed to enforce the statute and ensure those schools were getting those things to the teachers, the wannabe teachers and they were supposed to test these teachers to make sure they had it. Obviously they failed. The system failed the teachers, they failed the kids, and that needs a change. Now, to your point, more focused, they're already talking about it. I've talked to people in, in the K-12 area, in the uh, higher ed area, they are meeting, they're talking about it. The governor is committed to working with the colleges to uh, uh, address that, that very issue. Now, you mentioned suspending some things, and uh, one thing the bill does is for six years, the world's best workforce, which was <coughs> developed in 2013, um, 
your bill would suspend that program. How come? Well, one of our goals uh, in the last two years has been to you know, stabilize the schools after two years of chaos, uh, give them time to catch up, and no mandates. Last year, we were really good at uh, preventing almost all mandates. And we didn't do anything unless we got some work with the, uh, the organizations that's uh, up here lobbying for the schools. So no mandates. This relieves a huge burden on the schools. No district, no educator likes world's best workforce. It's a lot of work, a lot of paper, and it has not resulted in any positive outcomes. We can see that because reading scores continue to drop. That came along in 2013, 2014 implemented, reading scores are going down. So there's no correlation between doing all that work that they don't want to do, that they don't need to do, and a positive outcome. So that's why we're, we're dropping it. That's why we wanted to go away. Uh, every district would love to see that disappear because they don't need to do it. It's not working. It's not helping. One last question before we move on. Uh, your DFL colleagues, while applauding these efforts at literacy, mm -hmm. are saying that with a $9 billion budget surplus. Mm -hmm. More should be invested in <coughs> students and in teachers. Mm -hmm. Should more be done? They've been investing billions and billions and billions and billions and tens of billions for many years. Literacy is dropping. The achievement gap is widening. I'm focused on results, targeted results. That's our focus, targeted results. Reading matters more than anything else. Kids come out of special ed, kids aren't behavior problems, and. and disciplinary problems, this has got ripple effects way up. Now, driven by parents, educators, bipartisan, yes, they want more money. But we funded them with a lot of money last year, one of the biggest increases in 15 years. So uh, I, was, I sometimes wonder what would they do, what would be the argument if there was no surplus? They got $3 billion of Fed money last year, we funded them heavily. We didn't give any mandates. <clears throat> We're focusing on the most important thing for kids and for parents and for educators, reading. Let's talk about a bill that you've been talking about for a couple years and it's kind of changed over time. It's making headlines now. It's the culmination of, of efforts to protect children from the negative impacts of social media. In this case, the bill prohibits social media platforms from using algorithms that target young people. How could this work? Well, it gives a cause for action for parents, right? So um, technology is good. There are a lot of good benefits to technology. But we have to know how to use it properly. I, will, I have said this from the beginning. These organ There's a lot of proof for this, too. Not just research, but people who worked in the industry. In the Facebook uh, documents that were released, these corporations, these businesses, know what they're doing. They have intentionally targeted children and adults to monetize their attention. When you do that, they get addicted. And that's how they make money, by, uh, by getting your attention, keeping it, and then selling ads and selling the data. That's how they make their money. They've done it deliberately and intentionally. This is no different than giving a kid uh, uh, a pack of cigarettes, keys to the car, uh, a bottle of booze. It's no different than doing that and saying, do what you like. This is dangerous stuff. The research shows it. It has to be used properly and monitored properly. We protect kids across this country and in this state from a lot of bad stuff. Rightfully so. This is done intentionally. It's free market stuff. But I tell you what, when you're selling something that is intentionally, knowingly harming somebody, it's got to stop. So that's what this is. It causes, gives parents a cause of action to sue. And then finally, your committee is in the midst of a set of hearings that's looking into the alleged fraud that uh, potentially occurred in a federal program that provides funding for nutrition <coughs> assistance to children in need. Uh, these programs are overseen by the Minnesota Department of Education. What is the goal of these hearings? The goal is to find out what broke at MDE, at the Department of Education, and fix it, purely and simply. We did not focus our, our target our questions and investigation outside of the uh, department. The legislature has authority to have oversight. That is our realm, and that is what we're doing. The taxpayers were harmed. People who were supposed to get food were harmed. The system was harmed. To find out what broke and fix it. To date, it has not been real successful. I have, I'm drawing some of my own conclusions from the three hearings that we've had so far. 
Um, they said the process worked. Well, $250, $300 million, poof, gone. Well, uh, if that's working, probably failure is a billion dollars stolen. But uh, there's a problem there. We're focusing on MDE, and we want to um, help them out. Senator Roger Chamberlain, thank you so much. Thank you. An amendment that would create a 100% clean energy goal by 2040 was not adopted during debate on the Omnibus Jobs, Energy and Commerce Bill passed by the Senate this week. To the A37 amendment, Senator Friends. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Section 216B defines our renewable energy goals, and this bill moves our goals to 100% clean energy by 2040. It's bold, and it's exactly what we should do. It defines the eligible energies, and it provides in Section 8 an off-ramp. So members, before you jump out of your chair saying, we can't get to 100% by 2040 because of blank, this bill, this amendment, would allow the Public Utilities Commission to take an off-ramp if we're able to show that the costs or the environmental impacts are not sustainable. So all we're saying is we're going to set a target. What do you think the rest of the country would think to see Minnesota set this target? They would applaud us. And I would suggest to you members, a group of Americans that would applaud us the loudest are the youngest Americans who have the most to gain by us attacking this problem head on. It's also a mistake to pass this right now while we're seeing rising energy costs that's hitting all Minnesotans just in the last few months and the last year or so. Uh, this is a topic that is on uh, the lips of many, many Minnesotans. We're gonna keep warming through 2050. We're gonna keep seeing the signs of the climate crisis showing up at our doorsteps in Lake Superior, our forests on fire in Northern Minnesota, so much that in Duluth last summer, we went out of our houses and we were advised not even to go outside. It was horrifying. That's just the beginning. It only gets worse from here. So no, the, the sky's not going to fall in the next two years. And no, it's not too late. But it almost is. It literally almost is. But you cannot move your energy portfolio without everyone at the table. And you cannot jerk it. You cannot. You have to have both hands on the wheel. And many of you, of, of you have heard that comment from, from me, and I truly believe energy is so sensitive. We are driving energy down the road, members, and we are doing a very good job at it. When you think about going forward, we've got a lot of work to do. No question about it. If you think about the closures that we have within our state, and I didn't mention Great River Energy closing the Coal Creek up in North Dakota, 1,100, 1150 megawatts, which they have to replace and are, are doing it right now as fast as they can. There is a lot of things happening out there. I, I, I don't know how we compare, but I can't hardly believe with, with the Excel initiatives and so on, and, and you, know, you know how strong they are, that we, we might probably be one of the most aggressive states in the country. I don't think we can deny that. But as Senator Ant or Matthews have said, you know, the, the market is working on this one. and will continue to mark. The demand is there. Frankly, to be quite honest, uh, you know, where do most of our emissions come now? Or at least almost equal with certainly the industrial sector. It's right off our tailpipes. And certainly that has to be addressed as well. But I think for today, I think what I want to say about what I've heard here today is don't take this uh, state short. It, it's going, and it's going pretty aggressively. Uh, we cannot move into this arena any faster than we can build out a clean electrical system. With $9.25 billion available to supplement state spending in this non-budget year, the Republican-led Senate and the DFL-led House of Representatives have different visions. Joining me to talk about those visions with regard to E-12 education is the ranking minority member of the Senate Education Committee, Senator Chuck Wieger. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Shannon. 
So the Senate Republicans' omnibus education bill would allocate $30 million to provide funding for teacher training in letters, or L-E-T-R-S, Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. This training program has been adopted by quite a few states in, to, in an effort to improve literacy. How important is it for Minnesota to make an investment like this? I believe it's very important. The 30.7 million uh, additional 700,000 would go for our area uh, training centers to help in rolling this out. So it's an important program. And so then the Senate bill uh, also one other aspect of it would suspend the world's best workforce strategic plan for six years. Uh, this program was created nearly 10 years ago. Education Chair Chamberlain pointed out that some of the goals of this, this plan um, is for third graders to read at grade level to the literacy point. Um, another goal is to close those racial and economic achievement gaps. These goals have not been met. So is the suspension of this program for a time a good idea? Is it time to rethink how we're addressing sort of these large educational goals? It's always good to review our existing programs, but to suspend it is not responsible. I was the Senate author for World's Best Workforce, uh, Representative Paul Marquardt in the House, and these are important accountability measures. Uh, an important measure for being proficient in reading a third grade, which we want to measure, I strongly support, and those additional changes that we have in the bill, but we should also measure if students are ready for kindergarten. If you're ready for kindergarten, you are very likely to be reading proficient. So recognizing that we put hundreds of millions into high quality early ed programs, let's see how we're doing on that entry. The importance of closing the achievement gap is critical. Also college career readiness and the graduation rate. These are other metrics in world's best workforce. Suspend them for several years? No, let's dig deeper and see how we can sharpen the, uh, we, the amount of people that are gonna succeed, additional resources that can be targeted. To suspend, no, not a good idea. It's not gonna happen at the end of the day. And we need to have these accountability measures. The Minnesota Business Partnership uh, testified that this was important, education of and other groups, so I stand strongly behind that, in addition to the importance of reading proficiency at third grade. And do you believe that this letters curriculum or this letters training program will move the needle on helping teachers be better at getting kids to read? Yes, I do. And we have re-emphasized that in committee. So there should be some additional money to help in teacher training uh, for this, but it is scientifically based. I support it. Okay, um, in contrast with the Senate's proposal, we've talked about two of the major points. Um, the House is proposing a $1.15 billion um, investment in education to support students' mental health, to provide more school counselors and uh, uh, workers, uh, social workers, fund services for special education and help English language learners. Why do these areas in particular need a significant funding boost? We have an obligation to provide resources for our schools. Article 13, Section 1 of the Minnesota Constitution, it doesn't say that we may provide resources. It gives us a responsibility. And the obligation now to help our schools is critical. Right now, and let's look, pre-COVID, mental health of students, of staff, was a high priority concern. It is only exacerbated. So we need to provide additional resources for counselors, for school nurses, for social workers, psychologists, others that are a part of that mental health team. There's, it's so well documented as to the need. Um, how are you going to increase proficiency in literacy if a student is also dealing with a number of mental health issues. And this goes for staff as well. Uh, burnout is at a record rate. Teachers are leaving the classroom. Over 800,000 across America and in Minnesota, they're leaving. We have a crisis and we need to address that in the mental health area. We also need to address the special education area for the cross subsidy. The House and the governor have talked about providing additional money 
for special education since 1975. It's been a federal right in the Individual Disabilities Education Act. And to the extent the federal government hasn't stepped up to meet its obligation, we have the funds to do it and we should. And this also goes for English language learners. We need to bridge that uh, and provide the additional funds and the formula, the formula, which is over half of what school districts receive. There are districts now looking at cuts from Rochester to in the Twin Cities, several districts go up to Bemidji Brainerd. Teachers are losing jobs and other staff. Notices are going out right now. And the formula has not kept up with inflation. And that's documented by business managers, by local school districts. So we have an obligation to meet that need. We set high expectations, we should, in world's best workforce for graduation rates, et cetera, and now they're asking for help. Districts are making cuts. We have the ability to provide additional funds. We have that obligation to do that. As far as we know, the surplus that we have is one time. Uh, a regular refrain here in the Senate is that this is not a budget year. The governor has proposed an increase on the funding formula. The House proposal, I appears to me anyway to be more one-time funding. Yes. Does it need to be one or the other? Do we need to do one-time funding because it's not a budget year or is there room to also increase the formula knowing that then it's a future obligation? It's a combination of both. And by the way, there's can be targeted tax cuts in this entire budget as well. And I support targeted, uh, putting the resources where they're most needed. I support what the governor has proposed for the 2% increase in the funding formula. I support the addressing of the special education cross subsidy and the ELL cross subsidy. English language uh, learners. English language learners. And, uh, oh, keep in mind, uh, people will be coming here from Ukraine others that have come across our planet where we have welcomed embraced people and uh, we have programs to help them as they uh, you know assimilate into our uh, workforce and English language learners is a great example I might point out just generally what greater investment in Minnesota workforce is there than in public education that is the future we can do it we have the resources Finally, uh, before we go, you were first elected to the Senate in 1996, and you did recently announce your intention to retire at the end of your term. So in the moments we have remaining, would you please talk about what you are most proud of in the legislature, your accomplishments? Well, there's, there's several items, uh, you, know, that, you know, just locally working on issues that could range from you know, getting funding for a, a public safety training center, uh, for the Tubman Center in Maplewood, and, you know, working on the bonding bill for additional uh, investments in education for the world's best workforce, putting these measures in. Uh, I'm probably, you know, you know, there, there's so many different things, but you know, meeting with people you know, in the community and bringing their ideas to the table, uh, having them testify, having uh, kindergarten teachers in my district uh, talk about full day kindergarten, and then in 2013 to see that we could actually have full funding. Uh, that was a great bill, and I'll never forget uh, meeting with uh, Senator Dayton at the bill signing and having a number of people. Uh, and we also talked about world's best workforce and ready for K and what our vision was. So those would be a few of the items, but uh, mostly it's been the interaction with the people in the community and then seeing people throughout this great state. Uh, when I was the chair of the education, we brought our committee to various communities uh, throughout the state and uh, I love the state and it's also given me a chance to meet people from throughout the country uh, that uh, work on education issues so it's, it's been an honor to be a part uh, of this process and uh, great to see that we are making progress but we always can improve and we will. Senator Chuck Wieger, I want to thank you. Thank you very much Shannon. The Senate's Omnibus Agriculture, Housing and Broadband Bill contains a provision that would cancel the rent control measures passed by the voters of St. Paul and Minneapolis last November. An amendment to remove it was offered and failed, but sparked heated debate on the Senate floor. It is an attempt to usurp the will of the people uh, by 
denying, calling null and void an election that they took to determine their future. Throughout the world, not just in North America, throughout the world, rent control has not worked. And what have they found when they studied rent control, which is probably the most studied aspect of housing, is that when you impose rent control on private property owners, private property owners, that stops the growth of more housing units. The issue is really local control and what the voters have decided whether we agree with them or not. And 30,965 voters in the city of St. Paul, which was 52.89%, voted for rent stabilization. Their voice was heard in a free and fair election. We have no right to retroactively rescind the voice of the people. The creation of thousands of housing units have been stopped, completely halted, in the midst of a housing crisis when we need those units, when Minnesotans need those units desperately. And then we find out that building permits are down 80% in the city of St. Paul when they are setting record highs in other parts of the state where rent control doesn't exist. Sometimes the voters get it wrong. Sometimes the voters should not be voting on something. To me, this is a constitutional issue. This is a value of property rights. And we need to stand behind those values. This speaks to the larger problem at hand with this amendment. And this speaks to the trend. I, I have to give credit, and I think Senator Dibble did this as well, to the transparency of what's going on here. It is to overturn a lawful election guaranteed in statute by a, by a charter city to vote on their own rules. And we're saying as a body, or we're attempting to say as a body, that we don't agree with that vote. And because we don't like that vote, we're now going to use our power here at the Capitol to tell those people in the majority, you're wrong and we're going to make it illegal or we're going to take it away retroactively. Anybody in Legislative 101 knows retroactive bills are almost always a disaster, and this is precisely why. We have, and we do all the time, have statewide laws. The Constitution does give us rights. And we can talk about liberties and rights, but government exists to protect the individual rights. Rent control violates the property rights of the property owner. And in my opinion, it's taking from the individual. There being 33 ayes and 34 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.